Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here with Dr. Nadia Azar. She's coming to us from Windsor, Canada. So I'm going to talk loud and slow so she can understand. A, eh, hosers. And I'm here in Globe, Arizona, 100 miles east of Phoenix. And we're here to talk about drumming injuries. This is a monthly show we've been doing for, you know what? You were here two years ago this week. Next I'm week. Saying. Almost to the day, day. Yeah. yeah. Because we did, the 25th was the day John Bonham passed, and we did our first of three shows here uh, in my studio that that day, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Gosh, I can't believe it's been that long already. I know. It's crazy. So, folks, what we're going to talk about is things like if you get sprains, but mostly repetitive injury, repetitive motion injury from playing drums and it might have to do with your posture might have to do with how hard you hit the way you hold your stick the way your drum heads are tightened it might have to do with your setup and where you reach so many different things um we'll, we'll talk no warm-up no cool down different things like that so we're talking about tendonitis carpal tunnel bursitis arthritis uh what else what am i missing all kinds of things back pain yeah lower back pain any back pain shoulders arches yeah. Um, pimples? Is that? Not Probably so not. Okay. Not, not, not in this realm, realm no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to refresh my monitor over here. So, folks, if you see me over here, I'm not watching the hockey game. I am watching our show so I could see your comments. So, what we'd like to, I'm going to bring up a topic, but in the meantime, tell us where you're watching from and tell us if you have any drumming injuries like this or if you've had any and how you got past them. And we'd also like to know if you've never had a repetitive motion drumming injury and if you consciously know how you've avoided it, that would be very helpful as well. Not just for drum, yeah, and not just for drum set playing, but in marching band, you know, often, well, back, back in my day, we had tri-toms. Now you got quads, you got quintuplets, you got, pretty soon there'll be nine drums on something you gotta wear on a harness, even snare drums, bass drums, you know, different things like that that can cause all sorts of ailments. So chime in, tell us what's going on. Nadia will chime in within her purview as a professor of kinesiology. She's not an MD, she's not a physio, but she could definitely lend her knowledge to prevention and, and how hopefully maybe how to cure something or what you need to seek to get something taken care of. Sound good, everybody? So I'm going to scroll down, bring up the show. And my first question, I just realized as Nadia and I were getting ready to go live, I realized, hey, I've got a topic I've never brought up. Well, that we've never brought up on this show. And I told Nadia, you know, I asked this question for like two years when I go live on Dan's Almost Daily Vlog two, three, four times a week. Quite often I ask a question that I never get an answer to. So now I think I will. I always ask a question, guys, girls, do you take your rings off when you play? I do. I, my knuckle's still swollen from something that happened three weeks ago. I take these off because years ago I had an injury and my finger started to really swell up and it scared that out of me. I was really scared that they'd have to cut off my finger or cut the ring. So I always take them off. So do you mm -hmm. wear rings when you play? And uh, I'll look at comments here. Oh, we've already got something. Um, David Dickerson says, I just had a right ankle fusion surgery. Got any tips? When you say, do you have any tips, uh, do you mean for more mobility or how to prevent that from getting injured because of the surgery or... If you could narrow that question down for Nadia a little bit more, that'd be great, David. And Martin Zed says, I have nerve in the arms, both hands, shoulders, good, don't be the drumming. So I think what he means is that he's got nerve pain in the arms in both hands and shoulders, and it's not good for the drumming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be difficult, definitely. Yeah. Is if someone's getting now I know there's a lot of questions you need to ask to get to the bottom of that, but if mm -hmm. someone has nerve pain through their arms and in their hands, 
is there a general first line of questions you would ask that would make them think, oh, maybe I need to do that? Like, are they warming up? Are they cooling down? Are they really hard hitters? Or like, where would you start to sort of diagnose what's causing it so that yeah. they can give you some feedback and, and you can give them more feedback? So the first thing, ideally, what I would do is I would want to see them playing because a nerve, a nerve issues can... Nerve issues are tricky because they don't necessarily, the problem is not necessarily at the spot that hurts. So you can have pain in your hand or numbness in your fingers or that sort of thing. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the nerve is getting pinched down here. It could be happening up here. Um, and so I would want to see what their posture looks like when they're playing the drums and how their drums are set up because that might be leading to some muscle tension that as that's like pinching the nerve as it's traveling up through the rest of your, your arm and neck. Um, so it's, it's tough to narrow that down without actually seeing someone. But so it, if you have somebody that you can consult with, have them watch you play, sorry, um, preferably someone who, like a physiotherapist or an athletic trainer who, I mean, ideally would be someone who is also a drummer or well-versed in the demands of drumming and would be able to have some insight in that. Um, but failing that, physiotherapists and athletic therapists are trained to observe movement and watch for problematic patterns. So even if they themselves are not drummers, they can still look at your posture and say, okay, yeah, I noticed that your shoulders are up like this, that's maybe something that's the problem, or you're reaching really far for your symbols really often, maybe if you brought them in closer, that might, might help with that and put less strain on that area and so relieve the pressure on the nerve. Um, so that, that would be where, where I would um, encourage people to start, is, is get that... Um, Get that looked at because even if you like get your, your setup and your posture looked at, because even if you go to a healthcare professional and you're, you're doing some rehab and you're getting it all taken care of, that's important too. But if you don't change the habit or the problem that led to the injury, it's highly likely that it's just going to come back. Right. So there's, there's rehab, but there's also prevention yeah. that needs to happen. Awesome. Thanks. And David Dickerson chimed in. On the further uh, detail, uh, the one who had the ankle fusion surgery, he's saying his issue he's really asking about is mobility. He can't mm -hmm. kick um, near like he could before. So is there a way he can build back some mobility with a fused ankle? Yeah, I mean, depending on how recently it was, um, if he's still undergoing physical therapy for it. I mean, ankle fusion, any kind of fusion surgery, they're literally you know, limit, by definition, definition, they're limiting the mobility in your joint. Right. Um, so how much of that you're going to be able to restore um, is probably limited. And, um, and I'm sorry, I want to interject. I'd like to know, David, if you could chime in, whether you play heel down or heel, heel up. And the reason mm -hmm. I ask is because if you play heel down, you're relying on your ankle more to do this, if, if this is the pedal. If you're playing mm -hmm. heel up, like I've done forever, let's see if this is the pedal. I, I'm using more the ball of my foot that's right before my toes. And yeah, I use my ankle, but I've learned to be able to flutter that front part of my foot to get some of that, to get that, to get that, you know, stuff like that. So it may be uh, to change your playing habits, but let us know. Do you play heel down or heel up? Because I think that's a big factor with that. Yeah, that, that definitely, definitely could, could be. be. And even, you know, if, especially if the surgery is fairly fresh, you might not have fully rehabbed or, or reached the full range of motion that you're going to get to yet. So it, it may still improve over time. Um, so, so don't give up hope just yet. Um, but continue with that rehab and yeah, try, try adjusting your technique a little bit to see if you can maybe, uh, maybe get it. Maybe it's a matter of raising your, your throne a little bit or potentially lowering it. I don't know how it's set up, but maybe changing that height might help get a little more leverage so you don't have to rely on the joint movement as much. Right. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a few things you can try. Yeah, and you could get a quick torque cam from Lucas Jacobson so that your pedal works more efficiently. <laughs> Had to give him that plug for that. 
Um, also, on a question like that, Nadia, does I know when we're younger, our bones are softer, they're more pliable, more flexible, they heal more easily. My mm -hmm. question is, does age, how much does age have a bearing on the recovery of a surgery like that, a procedure like that, and building back more mobility? And, and David, let us know if you'd like how old you are or your age range. Um, like mm -hmm. someone like me, upper 50s, is that different than for a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old or that procedure is that procedure, and it's going to be the same. Age isn't really a factor. Yeah, um, I think it does depend procedure to procedure. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, when you're younger, you do rehabilitate more quickly. Um, your your cellular turnover is just, your your metabolic systems are just faster when you're younger, and so just inherently, you know, someone who's younger is going to heal. Um, and recover more quickly. Also, part of that can be because you know, if you're if you're younger, you might be more active. You generally have more muscle fibers, so you can regain strength more quickly. Or you might have more to begin with, so you're losing less that you have to recover. Um, so recovery can be more difficult. Um, you know, there's exceptions to everything, but it it can take longer and it can be more difficult uh, as you get uh, up there in age. Right. Cool. Now here's someone with a drumming injury who's not a drummer. And that looks like Billy Tanglewood says, mostly from standing too close to the drummer's crash cymbals. <laughs> um, and Adam Gurung says, any tips for managing RSI? I've got little bumps on my hands and arms. And I'll get to a couple others, too. I don't know what RSI is. Do you? Yeah, RSI, well, I'm assuming RSI is short for repetitive strain injury. Oh, okay. Um, so tips for managing RSI. Um, again, same, same kind of thing, I would say, is, is the first thing is to uh, get some rest to help the tissues recover. Um, maybe it doesn't mean necessarily stop playing completely, but it means play within a pain-free range in terms of duration, movement, all those things. Um, or if it's that bad, you might have to back off completely for a little while. But in addition to that, and I know, sorry. <laughs> but in addition to that, um, it, it's so important to look at how you're set up, how you're playing, what your posture looks like, so that you can address any potential issues that might be leading to that injury so that it doesn't come back after you put in all that effort to rehab it. Yeah, I had to take two weeks off recently, um, just real quick, and then I'll, I'm not, if it's for me, I'm not here. <laughs> uh, and then I'll, sorry, I'll, Mom. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll look at some other questions too, folks, so keep them coming. Um, but on our last show, I had discovered that I injured a lot of this tissue back here on my right arm, and mm -hmm. I did it from something really silly. It was from, we have this flagpole on the outside of one of our doors. Um, exterior doors, it's on a wall mount, so it's at an angle, and the wind would blow and wrap the flag around the pole. So like a dum-dum, I'd go out there, and I'd reach over, and it's a reach about like this, and I'd twist it. Well, after about three weeks of that, this got all jacked up. I finally figured it out. I thought I hurt myself drumming and couldn't figure out what I was doing differently, and then I went and turned the flagpole and went, ah! I went, oh! So I actually... <laughs> My wife and I went away and, and drove and saw some of the kids for a little while. And and then I came back and didn't play for another week. And it started mm -hmm. to feel a lot better. And I was putting, like, muscle cream on it and stuff like that. And, and I played, uh, I did the Neil Peart thing on his birthday on the 12th. And I played again yesterday. And it, I'm at probably 85%, whereas I was at, like, 50%. It was hard to carry a watering can in the car. It was like I'd forget and pick something and go, eh! You know, so sometimes yeah. it's worth it to take that break and and do what you need to not do. Otherwise, like Nadia says, if you come back too early, just like any other sports injury, come back too early. Not only will you injure it again, but it could be more susceptible to a worse injury, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a worse injury, just re-injury. Oh, okay. Um, 
So, so it's just, you, you, yeah, yeah, if you, if you, if you do the rehab, rehab but you don't change any of the habits that led to the issue in the first place, place yeah. then you, you're, you're putting yourself at risk of having that injury come back. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, not necessarily, it, it could get, get worse, um, but it, it, it worse aside, it's just that it, it could come back after all that effort, yeah. you could end up in the same boat and starting over. Um, but you bring up the idea of like, just like other athletes. And so I'm going to answer your original question, which was about playing with rings on or other jewelry on. Yeah. And most athletes, uh, don't play with, uh, jewelry on for those reasons. In fact, there's a lot of leagues, uh, I'm not sure about major leagues, but it would seem intuitive, but, you know, in, in school sports, varsity sports, that sort of thing, there are actually rules against wearing jewelry, um, down to even earrings, um, yeah. that they have to, you know, tape over them if they can't take them out. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, if it's, you know, you're playing volleyball and earring you get caught in the net if you're too close to it. And injury. Yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, or, you know, particular with rings is if you jam a finger, um, you know, and it swells up, exactly what you said, you could end up, you're not probably not going to have to cut your finger off. Um, if you get <laughs> medical attention in time, but if your finger swells, that ring can cut off the circulation in that finger. And so you'll have to cut the ring. Um, so it is a good idea not to play with jewelry. I would, like, like, if someone would ask me my opinion, I would say I would take it off while you're playing. Um, I do know some people who wear those, uh, one of the brands is Enzo, um, but they're basically those silicone rings. Um, yeah. That at least, that way, if, you know, you, you do have an injury while you're wearing it, it's stretchy, so you'll be able to take it off easily, or if you have to cut it, it's silicone, that's no big deal. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. That's real helpful. Thanks. David, it's, Chiming in again, the one with the fused uh, ankle surgery says, I used to play both ways because I would get bored, meaning heel up and heel down, uh, but mostly up. Okay, good. And he's 30, and he's yeah. asking me what that plug was again. So there's a product called the Quick Torque Cam. If you look up Quick Torque Cam by Eccentric Systems, it's an invention by Lucas Jacobson that goes on... Um, the cam part of your bass drum pedal, the joint basically, and it actually makes it so that it's more responsive and you can play quicker and even get more power out of it with less effort. So look that up. I don't have the link handy. I'm sorry. Check it out. I'll, I'll put it in later, uh, but it's easy to find on Google. Not now. Just after the show, dude. Hold on. <laughs> uh, a couple other uh, cool questions here. Marcel Lightning. Dubé <laughs> says, uh, I once played a show and inverted my left hand, had to use glucosamine for a few weeks to align it with my right hand. It took a few years to change my style, now back in action. I also hear that camphor is good for that too. Mm. Do you know what he means? Are you familiar with that? I, I'm, I'm not sure what he means by inverted his left hand. hand. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking he means like he maybe hyperextended a finger or, or, or rotated somehow. Yeah, somehow. you know, really bent something the wrong way. Yeah. Um, I've, I've never heard, heard of camphor. I, I don't know what that is. is. I'm not really big on, I, I'm not well versed on supplements. And part of that is on purpose because I don't totally think they all work as well as they should. Um, I actually just asked my chiropractor about glucosamine last time I saw him because it's come up a few times. I was curious about it, and he said kind of the same thing. Like some people use it and swear by it, and it does well for them. Other people, it doesn't really do much for them. I think that scientifically, and again, I don't know this for sure. So I haven't looked it up myself, um, but I think the science is not really. Um, advanced on that. I don't think there have been a lot of really good, large, well-controlled studies on it. Um, from what the impression I got from him was that it is, it's a lot of anecdotal and for some people it works and others it doesn't. So, interesting. That's yeah. real interesting. But I've never heard of Kemper. I don't know what that is. Okay. Thanks. And sorry, I'm reading. 
Marcel also asked, sometimes it makes me wonder if things over time with an increase of cholesterol are related to heart attack. I don't know about that one. Um, yeah. I saw something else I wanted to get to. Uh, bear with me. Oh, Kevin McKivergan says, only my ego, but that's ongoing in regards to a drumming injury. Uh. <laughs> um, and... Hank Jan Warmungur, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Hank Jan. He says, tips about tennis elbow by drumming and from lifting drums as well. Talk, please talk about what tennis elbow, you know, that's kind of a slang name. Um, but mm -hmm. talk, talk about what tennis elbow actually is and what okay. in drumming could cause that same effect. Okay, um, so... The uh, medical name for tennis elbow is medial epicondylitis. Which is why um, you all know we, why we refer to it as tennis elbow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and what it basically is, is so this, the epicondyle is a bony part of the bone that forms your upper arm, the humerus. It's actually, this is your funny bone, right? Humerus, ha ha. But, um, yeah, and happy joke. But anyway, there's this bony here. This is the epicondyle. There's one on the inside of your elbow and one on the outside of your elbow. And the muscles that control the flexing, flexion and extension of your forearm, uh, and start, uh, well, they start down here, but they end either they attach on one of those two surfaces. And so from repeated flexion and extension motion, that can aggravate the tendons and causes inflammation. So anything that ends in itis means inflammation. Okay. So epicondyl itis means inflammation at the epicondyl. Got it. Thanks. So yeah, it's typically it's uh, typically results from repetitive motion. So even part of the way um, you see it, it's called tennis elbow because it's common in tennis players from the repeated flexion and extension. And, and, and the high forces also. also. So, so those muscles um, that attach here, you think of you know, hitting a tennis racket or even hitting a drum, a lot of force that goes into it. So there's a lot of tension in those muscles. So that's yet another reason of, yeah, grip. So why you want to relax your grip while you're playing or try to play as relaxed as possible is it puts less strain on your muscles. It put, then puts less strain on the attachments to the bones as well. And it maybe reduces your risk of developing some of those injuries. It also means you'll transmit less vibration from the shock of the impact on the drums and cymbals. Um, tight muscles transmit more tension, or more vibration, sorry. So playing relaxed also helps limit or reduce the amount of vibration that's traveling up your arm, and vibration is also known to cause injuries. Very interesting, thanks. And do you, have, um, do you have any tips for if someone feels they have that, what should they, what can they do to change, what can they change to make that subside or not suffer from that anymore? Is there any clear answer to that? Um, not, not without seeing, seeing what they're doing to lead to it, other than the generic things like try to, try to relax more. Um, again, again, posture, posture is, is really important. It could be that, um, you know, or potentially even their, their grip. So maybe if they're playing more with the uh, German grip where it's more up and down, maybe they try switching to French grip. Right. Um, or at least rotating between them so that you might be straining uh, muscles differently. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough to make specific recommendations without seeing what the person's doing. Um, definitely it's probably worth getting that checked out unless he, it sounds like he's got a diagnosis he probably already has had it checked out but continuing to follow the you know the recommendations of the physio in terms of like icing and whatever they prescribe for stretches and things like that right and you know that that reminds me for the injury i described was i doing the right thing by putting heat rub on it or should i have been icing it when it bothered me you are the, the elbow, elbow injury. Yeah, this tissue behind the elbow—it's like right through there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah that's, that's probably uh, some, some tricep, tricep tendonitis. Um, your, your tricep, tricep muscle, muscle at the back, back of your arm. arm. Yeah. Um, most likely, so, so those heat runs, runs are better, better for muscle, muscle injuries and relax, relax helping to, you know, relieve some, some of that. that. If you, you think, think it's tendon involvement, I, I, my understanding is that you would probably want to be icing that, that instead. Um, because, because the ice helps with, with it, does it does help with the pain, it also can help reduce the inflammation. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah so, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know that, that it was necessarily hurting anything, anything but that's, that's a, a, that's a better, better question for an actual, you know, a physio or a, a medical, medical doctor who could answer that more specifically. Okay. But I, I would think, think that you want to be icing it rather, rather than, than putting heat rub on it. Thanks. I'll look up the recipe of how to make ice and try that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I it's complicated. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Tim Bragg is tuning in from France. He says he just tuned in and you're talking about his problem, mm -hmm. which he thinks might be tennis elbow as well. Um, mm -hmm. Marcel chimes in again saying, as to glucosamine, uh, it kind of rubberizes the bones. Vitamin K2 is good for stre strengthening bones. It's a bone strengthener, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and... So another question. Sorry. Oh, Marcel, Marcel commented in about my ring finger and little finger kind of pushing down, down and snap it back in place. Oh, yikes. Ow. Oh, oh, he's talking about uh, kefir. Oh, to drink. drink. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, well, I've never, never had, had kefir, kefir, like dairy kefir, kefir. I've had coconut, coconut kefir, kefir, and it's really good. good. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back up to see if I can see the context for the question. I also hear that kefir is good for it, too. Yeah, yeah I, again, I, I don't really know. Um, nutrition is not my area of expertise, so I, I don't really know the answer to that as to whether it would be good for that sort of thing. I think there's a lot of information out there about those kinds of things. So how much of it is factual and, and rooted in scientific evidence, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I can't really comment on that. That's okay. I'm, I'm curious uh, to ask our viewers, how many of you suffer from or have had a sort of lower limb or lower body injury like sciatica or hip? issues or anything with your legs, knees, ankles, things like that. Um, I, years ago, I had um, like some weird hip stuff going on and I realized it was how my set was set up and mm -hmm. I've, I've changed it. If you watch my Dan's Almost Daily Vlog, it's a little deceptive to see this if you're seeing a front camera view, but my, my pedals are set up so that, and my bass drum my bass drum's not directly in front of me. I've moved it over here so that if I just sit normal in a chair and my two feet are at about a 35 to 45 degree angle from my body, that's where my bass drum goes. So it's a natural position rather than being kind of turned where my body's this way, but my hips, you know, that whole thing is what caused it. Um, mm -hmm. So you all might, may want to think about changing your setup a bit and the reason I say that front view is deceptive, if you see it, is because that camera is kind of moved over more that way. So it almost looks like mm -hmm. you're looking at a normally set up drum set straight on. But if it were straight on, you'd see that my bass drum is cocked to the, it, like from where I sit, it's about facing 2 o'clock as opposed to 12. Mm -hmm. And it, it made a huge difference. Yeah. And I was able to lower these two toms right in front of me a bit more and just change things. You know, that one symbol I tell you that is kind of maybe a little too awkward for me? Yeah, you well, said last time that you were, you were still working on it. You couldn't quite get it right. right. You, you were trying, trying to get, get it into, into the right, right spot. spot. And, 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 and while I was sitting here and we've been talking, I think I have a fix for it. It will create a domino effect where three, four other <laughs> things kind of slightly have to move a little bit. And drummers, you know that if you... If something's in the wrong place, wrong place, not the place you're used to by one inch, it like somehow makes a difference, you know? Mm -hmm. If you think about the ride symbol, you got the bell, 
You got the shoulder of the bell. You got the crest right before the bell. You got the whole crest and the symbol. Then you got the, you know, and if any of that is awkward at all from what you're used to, your reach is like throws everything off. So, but I have an idea yeah. of how to try a fix where it's not way up there next to that other stacker thing. Sorry, just a little side note. I I just realized. <laughs> you know what? If, if you, you when you change, change it, do me a favor. favor. Have an engine take, take a, a picture, picture of you hitting it where it is now. now. And then, and then yeah, yeah, do a before, before and after because I want to see, see the difference. difference. My, my, Once you get, get to where you like it. it. My idea is changing the position by about two feet lower and <laughs> squeezing it in with this other more lateral stuff I have and somehow mm -hmm. making it fit there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I could do that. I, I know I could, I just realized I know I could change it by at least a foot, at least 12 wow. inches. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's a, a huge, huge difference. difference. Yeah. That's yeah. Like a big difference in your, like, like your shoulder, shoulder joint angles, angles and stuff like that. that. So, and yeah, what's worse, like what's worse is that it's on a stand that's an extended arm off of the normal upright stand <laughs> that has the inverted stacker. And when I hit it, after a few times, it moves away slightly. So uh. then it's even harder. <laughs> I got to fix that. I got to fix it. Let's see what else we got. Oh, Brian Cahoon says L1, L2, L4 injuries, bad motorcycle rider. <laughs> well, that could definitely affect your posture and the way you play. Yeah. Um, let's see. No one chiming in yet regarding lower injuries, like, again, lower back, sciatica, hips, anything with your knees, folks, and, and you know, whether you're guy or a girl, if you're a drummer, you can definitely incur all kinds of repetitive motion injuries. Other than mm -hmm. what we won't count, and I say this almost every episode, is the earache from listening to your lead singer just go on and on and on about all their BS. So we're not counting that as a drumming injury. No. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, like I've mentioned before, it's, it's not really surprising that there aren't too many people, you know, writing in about lower limb injuries it really didn't come up uh nearly as often as i was expecting it to in the drummer injury survey results right. i really was expecting to hear more about ankle injuries um and hip issues um and they did like they were there but not nearly to the level that the upper limb injuries were right um so you still have a lot of data to, that you could probably plow through and clean other stuff. And if I remember correctly, let me think, that was, don't tell me, I think two years ago this past April that we put, yeah. right? That you were getting yeah. people to fill out the questionnaire of the study. Yep. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, February through April, 2018. And it, so I started developing a survey in like May, June of 2017. And it just got published in a peer-reviewed academic journal this month. Wow. So, yeah, this stuff takes a long time to roll out. But I, uh, I'm i going to put the link to the, the article in the comments because it's uh, it's open access. So it's cool. free for anyone to download. It's not behind a paywall. Oh, so that's anybody great. who wants to see it can uh, download a copy for free. So I'm going to plug that in there right now. That's awesome. And Hopefully. Stephen... Uh Stephen Schinder, who's helping to share this everywhere, associate producer, go ahead and pin that comment Careful. to the top so it's easy for everybody to see. i got to make sure I'm sharing it from my other platform, though. Hold on. <laughs> and then um, after you put that up and Steve pins it, in closing, can you give everybody, after you do that, can you give everybody a friendly reminder of, you know, the fact that drumming is like any other athletic activity and that we really do need to be conscious of warming up and cooling down. I know a lot of drummers before their gigs are used to warming up, whether it's on a practice pad, a table, their mm -hmm. thigh or whatever, but I don't know how many drummers cool down and if it's a gig versus playing by themselves for fun or a rehearsal, there might be two different ways of doing that. I would think a gig might be a little bit more challenging, but what, what feedback can you give? For, to leave everybody with that. 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, my, my work with professional drummers has clearly showed that playing the drums is very physically demanding. And so, you know, their, their heart rates and energy expenditures are right up there with other professional athletes. Um, and we know from the survey that it takes a toll on the body. And so some of the ways that you can help to your body to be able to handle that is warming up and cooling down will certainly help with that. Now, when we talk about warming up, it's, you know, getting on the practice pad is great, but that is only warming up your upper limb muscles, really your wrists, essentially. Um, so when we talk about a warm up for, if you're gonna be playing for a long period or especially a heavy session, you really should be doing like a full body warm up. And it doesn't have to be very long, but you know, it, grab a jump rope, a skipping rope, or do some jumping jacks, yeah, 30 exactly. seconds, you know, a couple minutes of that, and then some dynamic movements of your major joints. So like, you know, do the arm circles, do the forearm pronation and supination, do the wrist circles, and then get on the practice pad as well. Don't forget um, the hula hoop. <laughs> sure, the hula hoop would be great too. Um, but yeah, any so warming up, uh, it's not just your muscles, like the specific muscles you're using, but warming up your entire physiology, your yeah. entire system, like getting your heart pumping, getting your lungs, you know, breathing a little heavier. All of that is preparing you to play for, you know, at that intensity for a longer period. And then when you're done playing, it's just as important to take a few minutes to cool down. Again, we're not talking about, you know, a half hour here. You need five minutes or so. Um, when you're done playing, get off your drum set and walk around. Let your heart rate slow down a little bit. Um, and then that's the time to engage in some additional stretching, the kind where you, like, assume a position and hold. So, like, you know, the wrist flexion and extension, stretch and hold for, you know, 20, 30 seconds and take advantage of the, the blood flow through your muscles and how warm the tissues are to help stretch them out a little bit. Perfect. Great. Let's just check real quick. Oh, I see your, um, your, uh, your article. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I see your comment with your article and Steve pinned it. So it's easy to find folk. Um, awesome. And uh, Marcel says, if you can remember, wear glasses and earplugs. I take my glasses off when I play. I, I refuse to take a chance of <laughs> cracking them. And then, because these are, these in particular, if you watch my vlog, folks, I wear these when I look at the laptop and read comments. I take them off when I play. I cannot read without these. I and mean, I literally have to hold something this close and squint. And I have another pair of glasses that are bifocals, but these are just the prescription of the bottom part. I will not wear glasses. Um, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Let's just see if we missed any questions. I think we are good. Oh, Hank says, Hank Jan says, lower back problems may occur. Oh, in marching, for instance, mm -hmm. that under ground slash bottom. Yeah, yeah, that I bet is sort of common. Um, Not to mention the extra weight from the stuff that you're hanging off your shoulders. Right, right. You know, some of those giant bass drums, I mean, those things can weigh 50 pounds or more. Yeah, and the multi-tom you know? setups. Yeah, the, absolutely. And Mike Skinner in Wales says sacroiliac joint has been a problem which pops occasionally. Mm -hmm. Wow, is that probably most likely posture related? Um, that could be, you know, if you've got some, some hypermobility in there, I, my, I have problems with my SI joint too. I can crack it pretty much any time I want. Um, I, uh, you know, pulled some muscles when I was in my early twenties and to this day, I still get chiropractic treatments, you know, once a month to help deal with it. Um, so it, it could be a joint issue. It, it might not necessarily be something you're doing on the drums itself, but or that caused it. But that can be something that's aggravating it. So working with different types of drum thrones or different heights, positioning, where you sit on it, you know, if you sit more to the front versus closer to the back, um, you know, playing around with that to see if you can find something that's going to be comfortable for a longer haul. Cool. Thanks. I see one more question that I want to address before we go. Tim Bragg says, uh, uh, let me find his other question. Sorry. Oh, I think I have been tense. 
playing gigs with a new band, so my shoulder hurts and elbow. He's asking, is it normal for the bone to hurt? From uh, playing tense? Like I from think it would be really transfer? hard to know if it's the actual bone that's right. sore or if it's the muscle where it attaches to the bone. Okay. Um, so in that case, like a tendonitis of yeah. sorts. Um, so yeah, it's really hard for me to say if that's normal, but at any time there's something going on, you should get it checked out. Um, and I think, I, you know, I'm always cognizant of like, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have health insurance to be able to cover the cost of that. It's important to understand that even when you're in physical therapy, what your rehab, most of what your rehab is, is not in that hour that you spend at physio. It's everything that you do outside of that. That's so to go to a advice. physio for, yeah, so, you know, you, you go for a few appointments to get set up and underway, but if you, you know, you got to do the exercises that they prescribe at home, you got to do the icing schedule that they prescribe or the heating or whatever it is that they ask you to do. So it doesn't, you know, seeing a physio or, or getting rehab doesn't necessarily have to be this you know, super expensive, long haul kind of thing. Right. It could be that you see them once or twice a week for two weeks and then not again for a few more weeks while you do the rest of it at home. Right. And when you think about, you know, over here, an appointment with a physio, I think is approximately $60. Okay. Um, that's Canadian money. Athletic therapists are about 45 So if you think about that's spending... That's like $1,000 in the U.S., just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's actually be the other way around, actually. $60 yeah. Canadian is like 40, yeah, 45, 50, somewhere over there. Yeah. Um, so anyway. So worth uh, it. Yeah, it is worth so it. I mean, you think about it, if this is your career, if this is your, you know, you wouldn't hesitate to spend money on like the newest ergonomic drumstick or right. drum throne. Invest that money in your body. Yeah. You know, don't look at that any differently. And because then that, that physio can give you tips to improve the longevity and, and, and keep you mobile um, and get you back to where you need to be. So it's, uh, it's worth looking into. Don't, don't let the, you know, the, the concept of like seeing a physical therapist, the, the cost might be lower than you think it is. Yeah, so it costs a it, couple it large pizzas and a six pack of beer. And you get, get yourself fixed up, you know, what, yeah. what's yeah. more important. Um, so. Folks, thank you so much for joining Dr. Nadia Azar and myself. We really appreciate it. Thanks for all the, the nice accolades I see as well. And uh, Nadia and I will be doing this again next month. We'll announce that date. And Nadia, thank you so much for taking time out of uh, the middle of September here. On a, I can't believe it's the middle of the month, September on a... Friday, really appreciate it, and we'll be doing this again soon. No problem. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for having me again. It's always fun to be here. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon.